Rugby Hall of Fame honours the legends of our game. Players and coaches who have performed extraordinary feats and given exemplary service to the game. The Hall of Fame currently contains 17 members. They're not the guys pictured up there, although there are some of them. I think Paul McLean and Tony Shaw are Hall of Famers. But um, you take Tom Richards, who won a military cross on the Western Front and represented both the Wallabies and the British Lions to the Hall of Fame. Queensland's first captain, Arthur Hickson, Hall of Fame. Paul McLean and Tony Shaw I just spoke about. And World Cup champions, John Eels in the Hall of Fame. Tim Warren's in it, Jason Little's in it, and Michael Liner. And today we induct six new members, each of whom has made that extraordinary contribution to the game here in Queensland. Includes the first coach ever to be inducted solely for coaching and the first woman, about time. There's a two time, yeah, fair enough, we'll get to that as it goes. To be eligible for the Hall of Fame, an inductee must have played or coached for Queensland, have retired from the professional game for five years, and of course made a contribution to the game. Now today each inductee or a representative from their family in some cases will receive a Hall of Fame lapel pin to commemorate their achievement as well as a commemorative magnum of Hall of Fame wine with all of today's inductees on the label. So it's a wonderful keep, uh, keepsake. Thanks to QAU's official wine partner, Ciro Wine. I'm delighted at this stage to invite existing Hall of Fame member, Andrew Slack, to the stage to present those pins and the Ceramide Magnums. Andrew Slack, up we come. I won't embarrass you, Slacky, by asking how it changed your life. Um, able to you've always been a man to keep his feet on the ground. What a wonderful concept, though. Yeah, no, fantastic. Obviously, um, I think, as you mentioned, uh, having the first woman Hall of Fame member is a, a great occasion for today. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not a lover of the word legend, to be honest. Um, but to be recognised by people who think know something about the game is, well, it should be done, basically. And I voted for you, please. You voted for me. Like and like tempo, that's so true. Uh, here we go. In chronological order, the Queensland Rugby Hall of Fame inductees for 2021, or 2022, Bill McLean, member of an extraordinary rugby family. Keep it going. Incredible. This family produced seven Wallabies. There he is. Bill was Wallaby number 332 and Queensland number player 523. Listen to this story. He was selected as a back rower in what was known as the second Wallaby. So it was a Wallaby tour went to the UK in 1907 and 1908. The next one left Australia here in August 1939. Arrived in Great Britain the day before the Second World War broke out. Those poor pricks travelled 12 weeks by boat, got there, and the Nazis uh, had a crack, and, uh, and the war was declared. They spent about 10 days in, uh, in England, they met the Queen, there was no, no games. They then hopped back on the same ship and came home to Australia. Those Wallabies of 1939, the second Wallabies as they're known, played one game. They stopped at Bombay in India on the way home and played a bunch of uh, English that were living there. They had a win. It was good. <laughs> they then all joined up. They were all encouraged by their uh, captain and the manager to join up, of course, in the uh, army. And Bill served as a captain in the second, third commando squadron in the Pacific Theatre, including parachuting behind Japanese lines in Borneo. Hmm. You reckon these blokes today would do that? Anyway. <laughs> Bill finally. So you think that's 1939. They're in the war. They're malnourished. They're doing... No exercise whatsoever. He made his Wallaby debut in 1946. Was capped five times for the Wallabies, including at all as captain, and 18 times for Queensland. The McLean stand at Ballymore, currently being rebuilt, of course, recognises the contribution to the game of the McLean family. Bill's father, Doug, senior, played for the Queensland and the Wallabies. His brother, Doug, junior, played for both, and his son, Peter, all played for Queensland and their country. And, of course, he joins his nephew, former Queensland Wallaby captain Paul McLean in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Paul, you're here somewhere in front of me. I can't see where. Sorry, Paul McLean's here too. Um, Bill McLean. Played for GPS, attended St Lawrence's College in Brisbane State High School, passed away in 1996. Represented today by his son, 
Peter Spider McLean, Wallaby Cat number 596. Peter McLean, can I get you up here to uh, please accept the Hall of Fame? share with you like a lot of those old blokes didn't talk too much what did he tell you about his rugby first you got to get him close thank you well, firstly on behalf of the um mclean family i'd like to um which is three generations of us sitting down at the table rounding up with um bella uh, mclean and uh, young henry weinthal coming up from gunnada we're going to we're trying to get him north of the tweed so we're still working on that but uh what did you share with us um Quite a lot in the upbringing. Bill was the type of bloke who yeah, always said, uh, if you want to know anything or help with any footy, come and see me. And I thought, no way in the world I'm going to ask him that. That is a defeat. But look, just as a bit of insight on, um, on Bill's football prowess or sporting prowess, he actually uh, started in football playing rugby league with the uh, 32 Queensland Schoolboys rugby league team and then uh, went on to play with GPS and before that, uh, goalie for the Queensland um, water polo team and um, uh, went on to, as uh, Marto has just said, at the 39 team to the UK and Phil Sandbags for six weeks. Um, you say that they jumped on the ship to come back? Well, yes, they did, but that was only after the Prime Minister at the time over in the, uh, over in the UK pulled off 32 people off that boat for the Wallabies to go back and uh, right up to Bill asking why he often talked about and uh, wondered what happened to those 32 people after the shocking time that those poor buggers had over there. In uh, 46, uh, he was, um, oh sorry, through, the, uh, through his um, infantry time with the commandos and whatever, he was um, captain of the AIF, Australian AIF team, which, uh, played obviously into um, division football. Um, coming out of the, uh, the army in, 40, in uh, 46, he captained Queensland after Queensland started up a game, after rugby started up a game um, after the war. And uh, in 46, there's a bit of a story on Bill's kicking prowess, that the SCG playing New South Wales and a penalty was awarded um, to Queensland on, the new, on, the, um, on their try line. So Bill's taken the ball and um, given it one hell of a punt. Now this is all written in the, in the, um, in the scribes one hell of a punt and it broke the diagonal um, New South Wales um, trial line post. Now that was um, unassisted uh, from wind and keep in mind there were eight, the, uh, the balls were made of eight panels of leather. So that's one, one, one punt. But um, to prove that he could do it again, someone had a bit of a crack at him and uh, uh, for a bet to kick the ball over the uh, member stand of the SCG, the ball landed in the car park on the full. Now to back that up in the following game, in uh, the Brisbane Exhibition Ground, once again there was a penalty awarded uh, in uh, the Queensland half, or Queensland uh, quarter, and uh, for any of you who know the, um, the uh, Exhibition Ground, there's a road, raceway track on the outside, the ball landed on the full um, on the track. So um, I obviously didn't uh, inherit that gene, I think it went to my cousin, but uh, it was that one. Um, 47, 48, uh, he toured um, the UK, but I would say Bill would be one of the unluckiest footballers to ever re represent Australia. Not only um, war being declared in 39, but going through the war and being selected again as captain in the 47, 48. On the fourth game, he broke his uh, leg, terrible break, uh, compound fracture, and um, spent most of the time in hospital. Um, and took on coaching of the, uh, the Australian side after that because in those days the, uh, the manager 
was both the uh, the manager and, and the coach. A bit different to these days when you've got a buddy. Can I just check that? I always heard as a young bloke that he lay there on the field and said, I don't want to take me off, one of them might run near me and I'll tackle the bars. That's, that's right, because if you're taken off in those days, there were no replacements. So he thought he'd contribute a bit. I think they might run around him. What um, can, I, can I ask you one? So seven wallabies out of the McLean family. No one, no one else, no other family like that. What's the key? I don't know, mate. It's just the love of the sport. It's pretty hard to be brought up in a family like that, you know, and not being to be associated with um, with football when you've got all these fellas uh, around you coming out of the hotel and, and talking to you. But going back to the unluckiness of the 47-48. While he was away, not only breaking his leg, his father passed away, and also his uh, best man at his wedding got, uh, got killed in a car accident back in Australia. So, um, but Bill regained, he, he came back as Queensland of the, uh, a captain of Queensland in the, in the 50s, and uh, coach and um, of the Queensland and Australian sides. But also, you know, the Burley Heads Maribyrnong Park, um, Surf Life Saving Club, captain to the um, state Championships and also the uh, he was stroke of the uh, state uh, boat crew and that uh, thing. So he's had quite an illustrious uh, sporting career. Well, well, there we are, the first one into today's Hall of Fame. Peter McLean for Bill McLean. <laughs> Grew up in central Queensland, the son of white Russian refugees. Wallaby number 490. Queensland player number 745. Went to school at Rocky Grammar. Played for Uni of Queensland Rugby Club before debuting for Queensland in 1962. He de debuted for the Wallabies a year later against South Africa at Newlands. What an amazing tour apparently it was in 63. He was one of the stars in a shock 9-5 victory. Who beats the South Africans in those days? We did. He went on to be capped 12 times for the Wallabies, 72 times for Queensland. At the time, the most capped player for Queensland. A punishing flanker. I thought your leg was rooted. How did you get up here so quick? Oh, well, you have had it operated on. He terrorised inside backs across the globe and played on the 66-67 tour of Britain, Ireland and France. An amazing story there. There was Ross Cullen who played one of the games on that tour. Uh, the hooker, he bit somebody and he got sent home. Jules didn't think that was a... Uh, he protested about it, just to show his integrity. After that, he never played for the Wallabies before. Put two and two together. One of his most amazing games was in the 63 Wallaby Trials. He was shifted to fly half. He was a flanker his whole life. Mid-game to cover an injury and he scored two tries in five minutes. I was lucky enough to play with him when I was a young bloke. He was still running around at uni in his 40s. He's a beloved figure in Queensland rugby. In fact, when Ballymore was built in 67, he mowed it with his own mower. It was quite incredible. His induction to the Hall of Fame caps the most memorable career. What an incredible human being. Ladies and gentlemen, Jules Gerasimov. initiation into the rugby football. Uh, I used to run, I swam, uh, did everything else. Shafired rifles when I was in the, uh, um, the, the, the army section. Uh, and I only started playing rugby when I came to Queensland University. Uh, that was in 1957 or 58. And I've had a lot of games since. Uh, I've stopped now, but doing... Uh, <laughs> I had to, and I, 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 I damaged my hip a couple of times, and uh, 
I had to have an operation well, two years ago where they replaced my right hip. Uh, that was quite interesting affair. Uh, you, you, you don't sort of realise it. But they got all the x-rays at home where they cut the top part of my thigh off uh, and sucked, you know, changed it with the metal, metal bars and socket, fitted it all in, and so there I am. <laughs> Should have brought those x-rays with us. Now, Jules, um, the friends from rugby, what do they still mean to you? The friends from rugby? Yeah, your friends. Oh, look, uh, we, we, there aren't too many of them left. <laughs> Jeez, you're dragging it down here. That's, 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 that's a big problem, but, oh no, no, we, we, we get together whenever we can. Um, uh, the numbers are down to, you know, just about nothing, but um, we, we enjoy watching the games if, uh, they, if we forget to see them at the ground or watch them on television. So we've still got some enjoyment uh, from uh, the, the game of rugby. Oh, if, if, you, if I allowed you to meet Fraser McWright, what would you tell him um, on how to fix his game up? Uh, what position does he play? Oh, Jesus, well, <laughs> same as you, mate, and he terrorises players in different ways to you. Um, well, uh, the, the, main, the main thing uh, I, I concentrated on was keeping extremely fit uh, and really tackling people to hurt them. <laughs> and with that, that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Grab a grab your rum, grab your bottle. If you need a seat, stay up here, Jules. Stay, no? You're supposed to stay up here. Grab a seat if you need it, but stay up here while we introduce everyone else. If you need a seat, there's one there. Spider, you'll have to stand, mate. You're not that old. Next up, Stanislav Pilecki. One of the hardest of hard men who became the first Queenslander to play 100 caps for his state. Wallaby number 594, what a story. Queensland player number 843. One of the oldest ever Wallaby debutants at 31 years of age, eight years after his Queensland debut. Can you imagine playing your first game for the Wallabies at 31? He won 18 caps for the Wallabies at Prop 2 with the 84 Grand Slam side. He was born in a refugee camp in Poland just after the war. The first, probably the only, I'm not sure, the only Polish player ever to play for the Wallabies. Attended Morris Brothers Razor League, played for West Bulldogs. And listen, if you don't know Stan, if you know him, you'll smile, but if you don't, you can probably one of the great characters of the game. A prolific smoker, a very ordinary sleeper, a renowned snorer, and the toughest of touring roommates. The joke was, and I know it happened in my, my instance, if it was your first tour for Queensland, then everyone thought it was hilarious to make your room with Stan. What an experience. His technique is a prop, and his levels of fitness were similarly described as being developed through sheer obstinance and a complete denial of the law of mechanics and principles of exercise physiology. He did not know what a f***ing gym looked like. He was renowned as a hard man. Actually, I remember him playing with him, playing against him. He, he'd have a cut and he wouldn't believe, so his whole head was made of scar tissue. He was a modern merit medical miracle. I, I hope someone did a study on what his face was made of. He just didn't bleed. It was incredible. But he was a hard man. His success, not only in rugby, but afterwards, going through hard work and a work ethic that revolutionised front row play in many ways. His contribution to the game, if you're unaware, is recognised each year with the Stan Pilecki medal, presented to the Queensland Reds Players Player, because that's who Stan was. Stan passed away in 2017 and represented today by his son Bart. If you could come up, Bart, please, mate. Bart Pilecki. Um, cigarette stain. Yeah, 
Now, you, your family shared him with Queensland Rugby for such a long time. How old were you when he stopped playing? He stopped playing for the Wallabies when he was 37 or 38. What would you have been? I would have been 15. Right. I think extra scrummer. Was he trying to play with you? Was that what was he was trying to set up? No. Definitely not. How was he at home? What was he like? A uh, couple of stories he used to say was... Um, I'm not a big believer in uh, fitness and stuff. There's one story where I think he went to prison training pre-season and Tempo used to make him run up the old hill on level four, uh, three and four pre-season and he said to Tempo, apparently this is what he told us, and they put a field on an effing hill, then I'll run up that hill. That's what he was like. We, then some of these guys, I don't know if there's anyone, was it the 84 tour, Campo, when he, I was rooted with him, oh it was extraordinary wasn't it, um, when they, uh, everyone had to invent a move, it was the last game against the Barbarians, it had been a wonderful tour and they, they, everyone had these wild moves where things were going on and they said, right Stan, what move do you want to play if we get a tap? He said, kick the thing out. That sounded like that to a team. What a man. Um, and did he, did he, did he, at home, like you were 14 when he was still playing, was he wrestling with you to show you, because you became a great prop yourself? Oh, his biggest thing was never to show anyone that you were hurt when you are on the field. And you'd be best mates with them after a game, whatever happened on the field, stayed on the field. He, he used to um, associate, associate with Steve Rowley a little bit. Too much. <laughs> um, Tony Buckley and Scott Harris used to go to their businesses when they first started, give them a friendly advice by spraying and said, you don't have the windscreen wipers on, but you used to spit at you while you were yelling at you for about five minutes and then everything was forgotten. Do you remember there was a day at Morton Island when he went out and he was putting the boat in, oh shit, I saw him fall out of that one day, but a, a stingray stung him in the Achilles and the stingray died. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but, he, he's got a few stories of Morton with his boat and everything. There was one time he left his boat out the front and um, the lifesavers and Musa rang up and said, oh, your boat's sick. He didn't realise it was gone. That was Stan. Hey, um, what an amazing man. Actually, can I, can I get uh, Peter McLean? Have you got... One of his great mates, I'm sure you know Spider yeah. Bart, Christ Almighty, these two were very tight on tours. Have you got a, 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 a stand story? What time does this finish? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the one that stands out, um, Stan being the fitness fanatic that he is, we arrived in the uh, in London in the 81-82 tour and um, it was very early in the morning, so we were dived in to have breakfast at the hotel. Then. Um, my tempo decides to have a training run straight after breakfast. Well, I've never seen kippers come up as much as you all. But Stan, he said, okay, we're going to, everyone's got to run around Hyde Park three or four times, which we did. We got back by the time I was never in the leading group, I think Paul might have been, but um, Stan sitting, standing outside the, the hotel. I said, how the Christ did you get back here so quickly, Stan? He said, I got lost, so I got a cab. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest characters in the game of Queensland Rugby, Sam Palenki. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> oh, the hits keep coming in terms of the Hall of Fame. Bob Templeton, uh, the first person to be inducted to the Hall of Fame solely for their contribution as a coach. He went to church, he played and coached down at GPS, and then Tempo coached Queensland a record, record 233 times in a period spanning 26 years. Some of those years Queensland only played six games, it's quite extraordinary. Coached the Wallabies in 29 tests, served as assistant coach from 1988 to 1995, and of course was there to uh, help orchestrate Australia's 91 Rugby World Cup win. He served as an Australian selector for 18 years, and you heard that, well, I heard it a few times, I voted for you. Um, he was a coach most highly regarded by the people who mattered most, his players. He was the original super coach. He was incredible. In the early 70s, when Queensland were going, how do we get better? He looked and said, we need to play the best teams more often. He was virtually the person who started Super Rugby, when you think about it. He said, let's play those bastards. It doesn't matter if we get beaten, because eventually we'll start beating them. Um, he was a player who squeezed the best out of everyone because he had the most wonderful personal touch. 
and he made you think you were the most special person. He, often he was lying, but it doesn't matter. He was the epitome of the true spirit of rugby. He was synonymous with the game, and he was so popular for more than 40 years, everywhere around the world where we toured. And the camaraderie, the late nights, were all magnificent. His contribution to the game, of course, is honoured every year through the Bob Templeton Cup, which is played, if you don't know, between Queensland and New South Wales. Bob passed in December 1999, just one month after watching the beloved Wallabies win the World Cup for the second time. What a man, and he's represented... To, oh, you are there, Rowdy. He's represented today by his son, Andrew Templeton. Templeton and the Pearson families to accept Bob's inductee, uh, Ducky Award to the uh, Rugby Hall of Fame as the first coach. Bob coached Queensland through three decades, the 60s, 70s and 80s, and he worked tirelessly through that era to try to turn Queensland into the best provincial team in world rugby at that time. He coached Australia for 20, 29 tests, and in his first test, Australia beat, in 1971, Australia beat France in Toulouse in a game that they were considered 101 outsiders. He was Australian coach when they won the Test Series against the All Blacks in 1981 and 80, and, uh, and that was the first time in 31 years. He was assistant Australian coach for seven years and through two World Cups, including the successful 91 campaign. The thing I most admired about Bob was his passion, his dedication, his resilience, and his ability to connect with players. He loved and thrived in getting the best out of his players, and his players loved and respected him back. He was a coach that players wanted to play for. Thank you. Andrew Slack's up here as well. Slacky, one of his favourites. Um, there's so many stories. Do you want to offer one or two? Well, I wouldn't have known him as one of my favourites. I think it's true to say that all the uh, players who played under him loved Tempo. Um, he called me Adrian for the first two years I was in the team, but the spot had I got over it. Um, but I, I do recall, and I think his favourite player, it would have been, the grand final would be between Laney and, and Stan, but when Spider was talking then about um, Stan, I remembered in Celta in Argentina in 79, I think Spider was in the team, I was on the sideline and Celta in Argentina is huh? you know chinchilla on a hot day really. it's, not a, it's not a big centre um, we got dressed in the bus and Stan is the reserve for some major selection oversight which Tempo was in charge of he was the reserve back row and Loney got injured and so Tempo Tempo did that when he talked and was agitated as you know and um, he was nervous, Loney was down, we were down to 14 men, and Stan was there, warm up Stan, warm up Stan. Stan's got a tracksuit on, it's 114 degrees. And, and he's got a windy red happening as well. That's, so I know it sounds ridiculous, you're playing for Australia and the rest, but Stan had a burrow in the tracksuit. And Stan, while Tempo did that, Stan sort of swayed when he talked and smoked. And, and anyway, Loney, Loney eventually gets carted off and, and Stan's finishing his smoke and Tempo says, Stan, Stan, at least warm up. Bobby, this is warming up. <laughs> so, they loved each other, the two of them. Everybody, one more for Bob Templeton. It's Grand Lord oh, Now we come to the bloke who captained Queensland to their inaugural Super Rugby title in 1994 and captained the side to a second back-to-back -back Super Rugby title the following year in 95. Peter Slattery. Queensland, Queensland at number 968. 
He played 109 times for Queensland. I remember when he left State High, everyone, who is this skinny little uh, genius? And he played for both West End University. He was Wallaby number 692. Now, he was capped for his country 17 times, but don't be deceived by that. He sat on the bench, I don't know if he knows how many exactly. I reckon he played, he was on the bench 42 times for the Wallabies without getting on the field. Uh, one of his most memorable games when he did get on there, we've talked about it earlier, was the um, World Cup quarter-final against Ireland in Dublin. Tam Campo might have thrown the pass, Naughty might have scored it, but Slat's bullet pass from the base of the ruck was what created it, for any of those who remember. Always, when he was a kid, had a ball in his hand. He lived with my brother for a while. He was always still, when he was in his 20s, just always had a ball in his hand. There's a lesson there for any parents of any kids who think they want to play football. Don't tell them to go outside. Let them keep doing it. A true rugby tragic. Slats took up club rugby incredibly after he finished here in, uh, in Queensland. Went down to, Sam, down to uh, Sydney and played with Manly and won the Shoot Shield in 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great men, Peter Slattery. First of all, I'm, I'm terribly humbled and uh, overwhelmed, actually, to be included into the Hall of Fame with so many great, uh, you know, Queensland rugby people. Um, but no, I played my first game in '85, I think, over in New Zealand, and then the last one was um, the '95 uh, uh, Super Rugby. Yeah. I know, I know, I know how humble you are. Um, now we got the World Cup story from um, three clean skins, a relative clean skins. If only we get Anthony Herbert up to tell a couple of true ones. Can you tell a couple from? Because you were always on the sideline and you were always the last person to leave any event. You saw it all. You were the greatest witness, late night witness I knew in the history of rugby union. What really happened in that World Cup in your eyes? Yeah, um, look, it, was a, it was a fantastic six weeks. Um, look, I said Nick Farr Jones was captain and uh, you know, a sensational player. I essentially thought to myself, look, I'm just, just here for six weeks of drinking and training hard in the morning and then sleeping in the afternoon and drinking at night. Um, but yeah, as it turned out, um, I was lucky enough to play three games. And look, for, for me, the most memorable, me memorable um, apart from winning it, was the, yeah, the quarter final, which gets talked about um, a fair bit. But for me, like honestly, I'm sitting, I was standing um, behind the goal line after Gordon Hamilton scored the try and I'm thinking, I don't want to go home tomorrow. Oh, oh, you know, <laughs> I've been rooming with Herbie for two weeks in Dublin. Um, I've got Slattery on Heritage there. Um, you know, like, it was just a fantastic time, mate. Oh, uh, Peter Slattery, one of the favourite players of anyone who played with him and a true genius of rugby. Well done, mate. Can we get you guys still here right now? Hold on, we're waiting for one more. I'm getting ahead of myself. And finally, to be eligible for the Hall of Fame, you have to have been retired from professional rugby for five years, which means that now we can finally begin to recognise the remarkable women who have transformed our game in the past decade. Has there been a bigger change to rugby than when women started playing? In 1994, I was at uni, I think I was deputy chairman or something or other, and they said, the girls came and said, we want to play, and we went, oh, right, I didn't realise you wanted to play. And from there, we have got the greatest transformation. And today, we recognise one of the most remarkable girls to play the game here in Australia. Wallaroos cap number seven, Queensland cap number 15, Selena Worsley, captain her country to two Women's World Cup triumphs in 2002 and 2006. I know. She remains the most capped Queensland woman with 34 for a cap for her state, five as captain. She won five, four national championships with Queensland. Came from Toowoomba Downland College, South Rugby Club. I think she also played for West End East over the years. A flanker renowned for uncompromising competitiveness. How many flankers have we got here? Oh, yeah, there's two. Um, her defence was brutal, 
Well, I'm sure was, but she was known for her attacking skill, putting pressure on people, so I'm still going, is that alright? Um, scoring many of her tries from intercepts simply because of the pressure she put on other people. She won a Rugby Sevens World Cup in 2009, 25 caps for Wallaroo, Wallaroos. Ladies and gentlemen, Selena Walsley. Where did you find rugby at, Downlands? No, actually, um, I grew up on Walker Walker country, uh, west of Bundaberg. I had uh, three older brothers and an older sister. Um, my brother's actually here tonight. He's the baby of the three, and if you see the size of him, you understand why my backyard footy led me to tackle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then um, my sister actually went to Downlands in Tim Horan's year. Um, which is where I kind of started to hear about Rugby Union. My father was actually a, a founding member of Como Dinelli Leagues Club in Sydney. So he was a league man through and through. They had uh, three babies down there. Um, and then saw the light and moved to Mackay and had my brother and I up there. And then eventually settled west of Bundy. Went to boarding school in Toowoomba. And um, all my worlds are kind of colliding tonight because Tim's comments around um, their, their tour after their World Cup win in 91. I was actually in year 11 at Downlands when you and Jason uh, chop it in the trophy onto the top oval at Downlands and I went, the whole school was up there and at that stage I, I played every sport imaginable but uh, I was like, I want some of that. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And um, at that stage women didn't play rugby even though I played sludge at lunchtime with about 40 blokes because that's what you do and um, it wasn't until 94 I was actually going out I didn't appreciate it at the time with a, uh, a fellow who, who was a Rothmans medalist we were actually uh, over at a mate a mate's house of his and um, he was on the phone and I was like what was that all about and he goes oh I'm about to start coaching rugby down at South shit women play rugby and he goes yeah they're gonna start and I'm like I'm in and he goes really When's training? Thursday night. I, I turned up down on Thursday night and I, I said, what position am I going to play? There's a breakaway. I said, what do they do? He goes, follow the ball and smash people. <laughs> Jules, I'm with you. Um, so I turned up at training on Thursday night and um, I did that for the next 16 years. Was, was, was I right? Was that 94? 94. 94. It was incredible, wasn't it? Um, the changes you saw, and, and now we've got the field court while the roof, it, it, it brings a tear to you. Well done, well done, right? <laughs> but how did it get to there? I'm sure I'm not the first woman that's cried in front of you, Martin. You didn't get it. addressing the Wallaroos team um, on the Gold Coast and um, I told them a, a bit of a, a story of the journey that we've been on as, as women's women rugby players and um, spoke about all the sports that I had played. I, I think I, I represented eight or nine sports at state level um, and it wasn't until I finished school and I found rugby and I went, I don't need anything else. Um, it had everything I wanted and more. It gave me a community and a lot of people here tonight that, that I know and love and that's that's why we're connected with rugby. Um, but yeah, when we first started out, it wasn't popular. Perhaps um, UQ were one of the most uh, receptive clubs. There were other clubs that um, were very anti-women in their establishments and um, girls were actively discouraged from being in clubhouses. And we may have been... Um, my two friends and I, the first women ever to go on that South pub crawl, um, which is interesting. I ended up in a wheelie bin on Ipswich Road. Um, That's when you know you're a rugby player. Sorry, Mum. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, she broke the glass ceiling and uh, long may there be more women playing, but also another member. But the first ever female member of the Queensland Rugby Ball Club. I give you this year's inductees to the Queensland Rugby Hall of Fame.